Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. There's been an interesting thing happening. I don't quite know what this means, but I've been noticing in the last few weeks that when I've said things that are overtly disparaging of religion, I've been getting pushback from my audience in ways that I never have before. And what I think has happened here is that I have spent enough time off the topic of atheism and religion, or the conflict between science and religion, that I've attracted new podcast listeners, mostly, who are not so familiar with my work on that topic. So it's, I, I noticed this in two places. First, in, in my last podcast with Andrew Sullivan and David Frum in D.C., I had said at one point, when debating the validity of religion with Andrew, something about you know, not having to believe any bullshit to lead a moral life. And my calling, in this case, Catholic dogma bullshit, was deemed offensive by some people. I remember there, there were probably some people in the room who felt that, and there were definitely some people who reached out by email to communicate that to be so disparaging of a religious tradition was unbecoming in me or counterproductive. All I can say is, if you were to read my first book, The End of Faith, or my second book, Letter to a Christian Nation, there are perhaps some surprises in store for you. It really comes down for me between the difference between believing things for good reasons and believing things for bad reasons. And good reasons or the province of rationality and science and honest conversation, and bad reasons are the province of self-deception and wishful thinking and conscious fraud and dogmatism. And there's nowhere where these latter attributes are given more energy than in the context of religion, where they get rebranded as faith and promoted to the pantheon of human virtues. So. All I can say is that there are some surprises in store, perhaps unpleasant, if you look at what I've said and written about religion in the past. The other piece of data I have here is I recently put out a meme on social media, which took a quote which came from one of my talks. I think it came from my debate with William Lane Craig. And the quote is, The true horror of religion is that it allows perfectly sane, intelligent people to believe by the billions what only lunatics or imbeciles could believe on their own. If you think that saying a few Latin words over your pancakes is going to turn them into the body of Elvis Presley, you have lost your mind. But if you believe more or less the same thing about a cracker in the body of Jesus, you're just a Catholic. So Paul Lachine, the artist who made my slides for my TED Talk on AI, made this meme. I think this is the 16th meme he's made for me which are all visually quite cool, whatever you may think about the quotation. So I put this out on Facebook and Twitter and saw a surprising degree of pushback. Many people were just aghast that I would take literally what was only meant to be a metaphor. The doctrine of transubstantiation is not a metaphor. I'm just going to read you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, lest there be any doubt on this. Quote, because Christ, our Redeemer, said that it was truly his body that he was offering under the species of bread, and it has always been the conviction of the Church of God, and his holy council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. End quote. This is not a metaphor. Those who now think it's a metaphor have lost their faith in the actual doctrine. So, I, I certainly stand by my claim that if you believe this about any other substance and any other person, in this case pancakes and Elvis, that would be virtually synonymous with there being something wrong with your mind, right? That this is disordered thinking. This would be a delusion, but a delusion that is shared or at least endorsed by millions and millions of people 
can't be called a delusion. In fact, and this is my point, the horror of religion is that it allows perfectly sane, intelligent people, right, people who are not suffering from some disorder of their thinking, to believe by the billions what only people who are psychologically compromised could believe on their own. There's a kind of epistemological safety in numbers. But it doesn't mean the beliefs are any more rational. It just means they're well subscribed. It takes a different sort of mind to strongly believe something just as incredible on one's own. Right? And this is why we treat cults differently from mainstream religions. Right? There's more of a social sacrifice. And the fact that a person is willing to make that social sacrifice means something. And in the ultimate case, the person who believes something that is completely unintelligible for the rest of humanity, well, that sort of sacrifice and isolation usually signals something about that person. In any case, it's amusing to see that I apparently have many listeners who don't realize just how deep my atheism runs, and I would just say that reading my first two books would certainly be the cure for that. Okay, so just a couple of things to announce. My next live event is in Chicago with Lawrence Krauss and Matt Dillahunty. And in fact, today's podcast is the audio from our New York event. We will certainly strive to not repeat ourselves in Chicago and in, in Phoenix after that. We have two events on the calendar. So after you listen to this audio, if you have questions you want us to hit, please email them or tweet them. Probably a few days before the Chicago event, we'll go out on social media and actually ask for questions. That's really the best way to guarantee that we don't cover the same ground. And uh, as far as other events, there are still tickets for many that are coming up. I have my first book club event with Steve Pinker in Los Angeles in the middle of March. And uh, a second book club event is now scheduled. I will announce that in a few weeks, but that's going to be with Antonio Damasio, the neuroscientist who has a new book. And there should be many events hitting the calendar soon here. So if you're interested in coming to a live event, you can go to samharris.org forward slash events. And as most of you know, those tickets become available to supporters of the podcast early and usually stay available only to supporters for the first 10 days or so. And now for today's episode. You've heard me with Lawrence Krauss before on the podcast. Lawrence is a physicist who will be familiar to most of you. And Matt Dillahunty has moderated a couple of discussions I had with Richard Dawkins. And you've heard him here as well. So without more introduction, I'll just say we get into several interesting topics here. We talk about nuclear war and Christian support for Trump. Trump does not come up much. Many of you will be happy to know. We talk about science and a universal conception of morality. We talk about the role of intuition in science, the primacy of consciousness as a fact, the nature of time, free will, the illusion of the self. Lawrence does not agree that it's an illusion. We may have to cover that topic again. And there's a few more topics here. In any case, it was a fun event. It was great to meet so many of you afterwards. These particular events are always followed by book signings, so the event itself was just an hour and a half, but the book signing winds up going for two hours or so, and uh, that really is the chance to say hi. So if you enjoy this conversation, there will be two others with the same participants in Chicago and Phoenix coming up. So if you live close to either of those cities, feel free to come on out. Otherwise, I will try to get the audio and release it here. And now I bring you the event I did in New York with Lawrence Krauss and Matt Dillahunty. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege and honor to introduce the gentleman who will be joining me on stage. Please welcome Sam Harris and Lawrence Krauss. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It's 
<laughs> okay, they're they're standing. You just can't see them. <laughs> yeah. We really, we really there, can't there see you. There are people in there. It's not a sound. Don't take lack of eye contact personally. Yeah. We'll bring the lights up before we get to the Q&A. How are you, gentlemen? Good, good. I, I have a, a disclaimer. A disclaimer. Yes, as, as you know, but they don't. I came down with food poisoning uh, two nights ago, so if I either vomit or have to run off stage, it's not because of anything these two gentlemen have said. Okay, that's what I want to say. Maybe, maybe if he liked you better, he'd feel better. <laughs> it's all right. We'll see who runs off stage faster if yeah. you vomit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I promise not to run off stage, mostly because I'm in boots that won't allow me to run anywhere. Uh, so today, you know, we're going to be doing uh, three of these. New York is, a, is the first time for the three of us together. And something happened today that was all over the news, and I thought it might be an interesting spot to start. Hawaii had an incredible false alarm today where an emergency alert system sent out a text message uh, essentially saying that a ballistic missile had been detected heading towards Hawaii and to seek cover, and this is not a drill. And 39 minutes later, uh, they announced that it was a false alarm. Uh, and it, it both intrigued me and terrified me about the new world that we live in compared to, you know, when I was a kid, the technology that's there to save our lives, and yet things can go wrong because we're fallible. Are we better off if we're terrifying people with false alarms? And how do we go about dealing with a new world where technology is in everybody's hands and can be used and abused? Well, maybe... we, we are in a context where it's plausible to, to worry that missiles could be headed toward Hawaii. So that's, that's the underlying problem. But you yeah, but say I, something some about sense, the I think people clock. aren't worried about it enough. Uh, I, yeah. I think um, in, in just a little under two weeks, I'll be going to Washington to announce the uh, new value of the doomsday clock. I'm the chairman of the board of the Bolton Atomic Scientists, as you know. And one of the things that worries me is that um, I, I think people have become very complacent about nuclear weapons. It, it, because they haven't been used in over 70 years, people tend to think they'll never be used. And the real problem is that this kind of thing became public. But there's a great book called Command and Control, which, yeah. I, which is terrifying. And you, you, yeah. and, and you realize how many close calls we've had. It's kind of amazing that there hasn't been either an accident or, or panic. And yeah, if, you, if you haven't read it, that's Eric Schlosser, his book. And there was a PBS documentary done on it. And you should, you should either read it or watch that documentary. It, it, read it, but, but, but you know, get, have a bottle of scotch or something when you're reading it because... <laughs> It's, uh, it is really terrifying, as it should be. And, and so part of the problem, in fact, of this, there's a lot of problems that people don't realize that, in fact, because uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, act relatively quickly, you know, in, in 25 or 30 minutes, that, that they, can, they can do their work and do most of the way around the Earth. Uh, we still live in a world where the United States and, and Russia both have about 1,000 weapons on, on a status where, where they're prepared to, to respond immediately. And as, as a lot of people, I didn't want to mention this word, uh, 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 but until a guy whose name I won't mention came in the White House, um, <laughs> people didn't realize this, and I actually didn't realize it either until I was writing a piece. But people now know, and, and if you don't, you should know this, that there is no, there is no safeguard against the president launching nuclear weapons. There's no one... He, he or she would have to ask. There's no one who can say no, and there's no, there's no constitutional check on that. And, and recently, some Congress people did discuss producing such check. The, during the Cold War, there was perhaps, the height of the Cold War, there was some reason for that, because there were 20,000 nuclear weapons that Russia and the United, then the Soviet Union and the United States were, shooting, were aiming at each other. And, and the idea was you have to launch them quickly. But now, there isn't that reason. And yet we still have that. And that's, that itself is terrifying because if that warning had not got... And by the way, the warning I understood was due to a shift change and someone pressed the wrong button when they went off the shift. This is true. Now, now, that raises a problem 
when I'm a, when I have to check out at the grocery store and swipe my credit card, I have to click yes like 18 times just to pay for my Coke. How is it, how could you possibly hit the wrong button in a shift change and not get a hey? Are you sure you want to send this but, message? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but imagine that went not to the sensible but scared people in Hawaii. But imagine that went right to the White House. Right. Okay. Well, to, and to read command and control is to witness how. By sheer dumb luck, we have avoided nuking ourselves, one another, and even ourselves. I mean, just so many literally times. dropped live nukes on like North Carolina, yeah. and two of three safeties failed. And the final safety was like a manual toggle switch that was just in the right position. And it's just it's with and in silos, this book begins with a with a with a with a potential nuclear weapon exploding in a silo. It is truly uh, amazing, and it really argues for something that we've been arguing at the, at the bulletin, and certainly I try to write about, which is that, that we are safer with fewer nuclear weapons and not more nuclear weapons, because the more you have, the more likely there will be an accident or a, or a, a false alarm. And, um, and yet we're in a situation right now where there are no arms control treaties. And what I was going to say at the beginning, which I think we were talking about beforehand, is when I, what discourages me when I write about nuclear weapons compared to almost anything else I write about in the popular media... There's less interest. I, I don't know whether people don't want to think about boring. it or they're just so complacent. To... Armageddon is boring. Yeah, Armageddon, I guess, is boring, or you don't want to, want to think Can about it. Can you say what you said about William Perry's opinion? Is that for public consumption? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's just but, us. But, well, well uh, <laughs> yeah, th th thanks, Sam. I'll think of something back. But um, uh, William Perry, I'll actually, I will, I'll use this as an opportunity. We'll be at my Origins Project in Arizona. We'll be having a an event on uh, a workshop on on autonomous weapons, autonomous weapons, nuclear weapons, and 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 defense, and and I'll be doing a dialogue with William Perry in a month. Um, Maybe give a, a two line bio of William Perry was the Secretary of Defense and, and oh, for Clinton, I guess, and and uh, and has been and is an amazing man in many many ways, and has a long view. He's not a youngster like you, and. Um, and, but he, he said in conversation that he thinks we are now living in a, a time that is, is uh, more dangerous than any time, even during the whole height of the Cold War, which is really kind of uh, sobering. With respect to this issue? Of, With respect uh, to nuclear weapons, yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue that people should be concerned about. So I'm, it's awful that that happened, but if it raises public awareness of the kind of ridiculous accidents, that, the ridiculous false alarms. Um, uh, there's a man who actually we nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, never, he's now dead, uh, but a Russian, uh, in my opinion, the only yeah. one of the few yeah. people who probably really deserved the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, a Russian uh, who was working in a missile silo, and there was a computer glitch, and it showed a nuclear weapon being launched in the United States, and he got the order to fire. And another was a, showed another weapon five minutes later and another weapon. And he personally reasoned that if there was going to be an attack from the U.S., they wouldn't wait, you know, four or five minutes between each other, or what, two minutes or whatever it was. So he disobeyed the command and probably personally saved the world. Yeah. It's, it's nice to take that warning that it went out today, even though, you know, it's a mistake. It lets us know about human error. It also may raise awareness. There, there is a potentially huge downside in, in that this could be end up looking a little more like a crying wolf situation where the next time, if it's real and you, don't get, you get that warning that you, you don't take shelter. Uh, but I th I, something you said is terrifying to me, and not because specifically because of who's in the White House. This, this is true no matter who's there. The very idea that Congress has to declare war, but they don't have to declare that it's okay to nuke people. Uh, they're need, you know, in, a, in, a, in a nation and a system that's built on checks and balances, this one thing doesn't yeah. appear to have sufficient... The most consequential balance. thing has no yeah. check and balance. Yeah, yeah it, and, I, and I worry. It shocked me. I don't know if you knew about that earlier. I mean, literally, I thought that it, there had to be approval of emergency staff or, yeah. or at least a majority of cabinet members or something. Um, but in fact, there is no check on that. I would like to think that if somebody decided to go rogue and do it, that there would be somebody sensible nearby, some Secret Service person who would do what that Russian missile... Agent did. Well, one hopes that, yeah, I mean, the people actually have to press the button, and their button is bigger than, than his. Um, <laughs> they, they, they would, it's a sober, I mean, you actually have to do it. I think those people think very carefully. But, you know, they're trained to realize that they may have to do that. And so it's... it's um, yeah, and they drill it all they, the time. All the time. Yeah. 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 So I wonder how this ties in 
to... I try not to paint with too broad of a brush when I talk about any specific religion, including Christianity, but there are a number of Christians, including some of my family members, who are eagerly awaiting Armageddon. Armageddon. Uh, it, it, we all deal with people who construct conspiracy theories on occasion. I don't think it'd be that hard to put together a conspiracy theory that the reason we have Trump is because there were people <laughs> who are okay with the idea of Armageddon. Uh, because I know tons of evangelical, evangelicals who were supportive of him when there's nothing about this man that fits like the churches I went to, even though I know those churches mm. are waiting for an apocalypse. The, the most benign interpretation of the Christian support is just their calculated assumption, which has borne out that he will give them what they want because they're a, a voting bloc that he needs. Uh, I remember I, I ran into... Ralph Reed, the former head of the Christian coalition at, at a conference, and this was still during the campaign, but when, when Trump was the nominee and was professing to be a Christian of some flavor. And I, ha I had no, I had debated Reed once on television, but we, we actually had never met. And I, I said to him, there's no way you think he's actually a person of faith, right? But what, how do you explain the, the, the Christian support? And he immediately fell back on this trope, you know, who am I to judge what's in another man's heart? I mean, insofar as I could tell that he was bullshitting, he was really bullshitting. He's happy to uh, yeah. judge what's in other people's hearts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But the, the worst possible interpretation is the one you just gave, which is there, there's a, at least some millions of people and maybe tens of millions of people in this country for whom biblical prophecy is real. It's a real roadmap to the future, and they're expecting the wheels to completely come off this car before the end, and that will be the best thing that happens. That's necessary for the best thing that will ever happen to happen. I have to say that since Trump got elected, I, I've been sort of hoping for Armageddon too, but in a way, it just seems better than listening to tweets every day. But, uh, but I actually don't think it's the Armageddon thing. I, I, I was actually just thinking about writing a piece about this, and I'll say it, although it'll get people angry, some people. It, to me, it represents one of the real problems of, what, of professed Christianity. Because when you said, when you said they, they, they don't think Trump is a Christian, but they'll get what they want. What do they want? Do they want the things that they're supposed to be a bonding, like love and no. all the things? No, what they want is hate. And, yeah. What they want is laws that restrict freedom of others. And that means to me that operationally in this country, when it comes to the politics, professed Christianity is equivalent with hate. Well, to bend over backwards, no, before... I want to see if there's anyone who... Would, I can't I tell mean, out to, to The most charitable interpretation is not that it's synonymous with hate all the way down the line, because it, just imagine if you're someone who really thinks that abortion is akin to murder, right? That there is no difference between killing a, a fetus at you know, the yeah. eight-week stage and killing a, a, a fully developed human being, if you think that, then you think our society is just spectating on a holocaust that has been going on for your entire life. And it's easy to see how someone would not be moved by hate and would, be, would in their own mind be moved by compassion and love and a concern for divine retribution if they believe that God is watching all the while. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you, you're right. It's extreme to say that. But see, you could say the same thing about restricting the rights of gay people, uh, 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 that it's really right. love because that's a sin in a lot of people's hearts. And, well, and sanely, therefore, trying... sanely, you can say the same thing about members of ISIS who were throwing gay people off of rooftops. Some of you, you must have seen this footage yeah. of ISIS members hugging with apparent sincerity, yeah. the people they were about to hurl off of rooftops. because yeah, it's a I mean, this was act. not This was not a, a, a naked a de declaration of hate. This was, sorry, this is how the game is played. We, you know, we have to do this. Well, that, you know, that too. represents to me that, I mean, that's the, that's the paradox. So, and, and I, I don't know if I've said it before on stage with you, but Steve Weinberg, who's a, a physicist friend, a yeah. Nobel laureate, and also an atheist, has, has said that... Um, there are good people and there are bad people. Good people do good things, bad people do bad things. When good people do bad things, it's religion. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. So the people are, uh, and, and it's not just religion, it's ideology. Whenever people move away from reason uh, and, uh, and justify, and we all do it, but justify bad actions uh, and as if 
no one, I think very few people do bad things thinking they want to do a bad thing. Right. They're doing it for some reason that they think is a good reason. It, well, we can go right. right back to Voltaire to, to address all this, which is you can get people, if you can get people to believe absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities. Yeah. Yeah. And once you have poisoned the foundation, which I think is a hallmark of what many religions do, of right and wrong, of about how we should go about determining what is a moral good. If you poison that sufficiently, that's how you get people to do that. That's how you get them to bomb abortion clinics. That's how you get them to throw homosexuals off roofs. Um, which kind of brings us to one of the questions. We, we polled a little bit. I asked for suggestions on uh, Facebook and Sam had asked on Twitter. And there's a couple things that keep coming up. But I, I think, given what we're talking about, uh, this issue of morality terrifies believers. I've been told that you know, atheists can't be moral. And then the people who have put like another half second of thought into it will say, well, of course you can be moral, but you can only be moral because you were raised in a, a Christian environment that taught you about morals. And I gave a talk for a number of years, but you wrote uh, The Moral Landscape. And I, I, I want you to just take a couple of minutes and give a summation of uh, objective reality, science-based assessments, and why people don't have to be terrified and why it may in fact be more terrifying if morals are just the dictates of some individual or being. Well, it's clearly more terrifying if the Bible is true or the Quran is true, I mean, because then the universe has been created and is now governed by an omniscient sadist. Right? I mean, we, he, he's created a universe with hell to be populated by people who he didn't give enough evidence to to convince them of the truth of his doctrine, right? So he could have just given enough evidence and we'd all be fundamentalist Christians or Salafi Muslims. But he, did, he gave, he, the miracles are always thousands of years old or they're in India or, so, or and strangely they're in places where... Same place UFO sightings or, are. Or upstate New York. Yeah. If you, well, okay. <laughs> but they're not sort of like the, the UFO abductions and the, the cattle molestations. It could happen right here, right now in front of 2,000 educated people and we would all be convinced, but that's, that's not going to happen for some perverse reason. I, I'd so, still be skeptical. Yes. I'd still yeah. be skeptical. We would still yeah. be, well, we but, would but demand... You can imagine if you're in actual, in dialogue with an omniscient being who's bent upon convincing you for your own good, you, that, that, that can happen very quickly. I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> apparently I'm dumbing it down uh, a lot. <laughs> so, but to, to tie into what he's saying, I've had Christians tell me that God wouldn't reveal himself to me because I would continue to question deny. And I'm like, what kind of weak-ass God do you believe in who is <laughs> incapable of convincing me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're just too damn ob obstinate. So let's leave that, so, that, so we can leave that aside. That's, there's something strange about believing that, that these books as written give you a truly moral worldview that you would endorse. If any person behaved the way the God of the Bible behaves, that is our definition of a psychopath and a, and a sadist. Yeah. But the reason why you can have objective morality, or you, I think that you can have a few short steps to objective morality, and what I mean by objective is not that it's all just a matter of atoms. The universe includes subjective experience. It includes uh, Consciousness is a natural phenomenon. Consciousness is a property of the universe. We don't know exactly at what stage it emerges in information processing in complex systems, or maybe it goes even deeper than that. I mean, it's totally possible that there's some spooky view of consciousness going further down than, than vast numbers of neurons or, or, or information processing units doing their thing. There's no especially good reason to believe that, I would say. A lot but of still, good reasons not to believe that. Yes, but, but still, it's not... The jury is, is arguably still out on that. What, what it's not still out on is a few fundamental questions. One, clearly consciousness exists. Even if we're living in, in a simulation on some alien hard drive, something seems to be happening, right? And that seeming is what I'm calling consciousness. So even if you're a brain in a vat right now, or you're in the matrix, or this is all just a dream and you're going to wake up in a few minutes and find yourself in bed, no matter how confused you might be about your circumstance, there is still consciousness and its contents in each moment. And there is a vast difference between excruciating and pointless misery and sublime happiness and creativity and joy and love and all of the good things in life. And we, ha we have no idea how far that continuum actually goes in both directions, but we really know, really, 
that we like one side of it much better than the other side of it. And we don't have to justify that preference. You don't have to justify preferring the happiest possible life to being tortured for eternity, right? And, and the idea that you would need some philosophical argument to justify that is, is just a specious claim that, that has confused a lot of people. And the idea that you would need to be able to draw your preference there, again, for avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone, that you'd have to draw that from some book that has been dictated by an omniscient being, that also is a, is a specious claim. So I view morality as a kind of navigation problem. And the reason why there, this is of a piece with, with ultimately a scientific understanding of the mind and a scientific understanding of human well-being and of, of conscious systems generally is that navigating between these two ends of the continuum of experience, avoiding the worst possible misery or, and finding the, true bliss and creativity and, and, and connection and love, th there are right answers about how to do that for properly constituted minds. And there, there are, for us, there are biochemical answers, there are psychological answers, there are sociological answers, there's economic answers, political answers. Every piece of human knowledge that's legitimate knowledge has to be brought to bear on the question of how to live a fulfilling life. And it is possible to be wrong, and it's possible to not know what you're missing. And it's possible to be right for the wrong reasons. And, and, and so every permutation of ignorance and confusion is there to be suffered and endured. And we have to break the spell of thinking that we need to live forever shattered by tribal dogmatisms in order to talk about there being right answers to moral questions. As Sam knows, we had a, a, another origins event where Sam was at talking about exactly this and had a bunch of We got a lot of pushback. From yeah, we got a lot of pushback. Yeah. yeah, but uh, so I, I think that, you know, I've had a lot of discussions about this since then. And, and it may be, uh, it is probably true that reason is the slave of passion for most people. We make, we, we are, we, are re, we, we, ha, we possess reason, but reason doesn't necessarily drive our actions. Yeah. And we justify things after the fact on the basis of what we want it to be, and then we find, come up with a rational argument for but, it. I think that's true. We Understanding that is another exercise of reason. I, I, exactly. And, uh, and, and, and for clarity, the question, there's flawed reasoning, but that doesn't mean that reason itself is flawed. No, but I think we're capable, and you and I and everyone in this audience does it. Uh, we, we all rationalize our lives every day. We you know, wake up, go, we rationalize that we like our work or our spouse or whatever else it is to, in order to get through the day. And, 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 um, Just let it be but, known that I didn't yeah, yeah, nod yeah, my yeah, head. To that. That's right. <laughs> let it be noted. But, um, it's only but, audio. But, 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 you know, and, and so I'm not 100% convinced that you can always get ought from is, as, as some famous philosopher once said. Um, but I do think, I agree with you completely that it's, that it's a process that you, without is, you can't get ought. I think that's the point. Without is, you can't get off. If you don't know the consequences of your actions in any way, and that's what science is. Science tells you the con and, or reason, and reason, but I view science as sort of reason based on empirical evidence, then you can't possibly make decisions that you can't determine what's right or wrong. You need so, to know what the goal is and what the outcome is going to be. What the outcome is going to be. So without a careful understanding of, of and then some people call this utilitarianism, I guess, but I, uh, I, I just see it as without, without science, there can be no morality, in my opinion, or no sensible morality. And I think what we've seen, and T. Pinker and others have argued, I think, pretty effectively, that in some ways uh, the Enlightenment and rational thinking has led to a, a world where... where where some things that were once thinkable are not thinkable now. And so I, there's no doubt, I don't know whether I would argue that we can, under, well, certainly I would argue that we might not be able to understand morality now, but that doesn't, that's irrelevant because we agree that not understanding something is not evidence of anything but not understanding. Right. The more we learn, the more we will understand. So I do think ultimately we'll have a, a, a neural understanding of almost all our decision-making capabilities. But, but certainly without that, Without that reason, I don't think you could even discuss the question. Right. Well, I, let me just take one minute to say why I think this is ought business is totally confused. This comes from a paragraph in, in Hume's work where he was actually trying to, to hold religious conceptions of morality at, at bay. 
And I think it's been misinterpreted, it's certainly been overused as one of these exports from philosophy that has just gotten into the heads of everybody and, and is influential, totally out of proportion to its, its actual validity. One thing I would point out is that Hume said he, he found many seeming paradoxes, and one was with respect to causation. Yeah. And if you took him seriously about causation, you couldn't really take science very seriously, because apparently there's no evidence of, of causation in the world. We just see a, the contiguity of, of various events, but we never see causes between you know, A and B. So this is odd business. So let's, let's say there is no ought, there is no should, there is, there is no obligation to do anything in this universe. There is just what is. There's just a, the totality of facts that are actual and perhaps possible, perhaps you know, also impossible, whether, that's, whether there's such a real, a real thing as possibility or everything is in fact actual, it's just happening in, in a parallel universe, right? Or, or trillions upon trillions of, of such universes. There's only, there are only facts. And the first thing I would ask you is if you can't get your sense of how you should live from the totality of facts, all of reality, where do you think you can get this yeah. sense of how you should live? So there's, you're, you're not impoverished having all the facts of, of, of the universe uh, at your disposal. Yeah. But and you still have, even if there's no such thing as morality, we still have this navigation problem. You know, put your hand into a wood chipper and see how much you like it, right? Yeah. You, you, you will very quickly get the message that you don't want to do that again. You will want to avoid that. And there, there are an infinite number of ways in which we can experience pointless misery from which no good comes. And we, we're, we're, we will find ourselves navigating. And all I'm arguing is that we call morality those subset of behaviors and commitments that relate in social space to this, this navigation problem of finding better lives together. And if you were alone on a desert island, you wouldn't call it morality, but you would still talk about well-being and, and happiness. And no, I agree completely. I guess the question is one of what one calls objective morality, if, if you want to use those terms, in the sense that everything you said, I think, is clearly true. Uh, the question I would have is that at the same time, because that now, I think... Because that navigation effort is, is sort of has an evolutionary basis, as well as a cultural basis, I think. What we know we, evolution we, is what, wrong on most of these questions. Yeah, but I think that our, what, that our thinking has a, an evolutionary basis, and I don't think that. I think it's clear that that's the case. Yeah. Um, then it means to me that morality is a moving target, too. I mean, the question is, so, so that humans are hardwired, I think, to find some things moral and... and and, and not, and that's an interesting question to find out how, how they are, and you, as you know, psychologists, some psychologists do test the famous trolley car experiment. And so um, when one talks about objective reality, I think it's, it's based on a totality of experience, but that totality of experience evolves, and therefore I'm a little more hesitant at talking about absolute morality. Yes, well, no, it's, I, I don't, it's not I don't absolute. use absolute. Yeah, it's, but, it's, it's a, but it's evolving into a space of right and wrong answers and real facts about con the conscious experience of actual and possible yeah. being. So there's, there's a right answer to the question of, you know, if, you, if you were going to ask, you know, if I add this compound to my neurochemistry, is it going to make me happier or not, right? Mm -hmm. Insofar as we could, we could come to some kind of completed neuroscience of happiness, well, then there'd be, we would understand more and more about the likelihood of either you helping or hurting yourself that way. And, but so too with any use of your attention. If, you, you know, if, I, if I'm in this relationship, am I going to be happier or not? There are right and wrong answers there whether or not you discover them. You discover them after the fact. Yeah, actually. right. Yeah, but like there's, you don't know what you're missing, right? Like you don't know what, what in a counterfactual situation you could have done something yesterday that would have made today much better than it was for you yeah. and you may never know what you missed. And again, so it's, realism for me, so whether it's scientific realism or moral realism, just amounts to the claim that it's, po it's possible to be wrong. It's yeah. possible not to know what you're missing. It's possible for everyone to be wrong. Like every physicist alive, we could, you could ask some pressing question about physics, and we, I don't know how many physicists there are, 30,000. All 30,000 could be wrong, and then tomorrow someone could be right. And I get letters every day from those people who say they are. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but How many, how many but, physicists are but there, that's the, the whole... But that's... I, I, it's interesting you brought up the example because that's the whole point of science. Exactly, yeah. The whole point of science, if, if you couldn't be wrong, there would be no science. The whole point of science, I mean, is to go in and try and prove 
your colleagues wrong in some sense. Uh, that's how science proceeds because it doesn't prove things right. It only proves things wrong. And then you narrow down what's left over. And, and so you're absolutely right. And that's what makes empirical evidence so useful. That's why it should be the basis of public policy because you f- can find out what doesn't work. Yeah. That's an essential part of, of living, but also what's what makes science powerful and worth, worth <laughs> utilizing in every aspect of our experience, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. There's a, uh, thanks. There's a, there's a couple things about the moral issue, and, and I'm glad you guys made the points. It's, it's, people confuse objective morality with absolute morality. Uh, neither of us, none of us, I, I assume, I know Sam and I aren't advocating for absolute morality. Actually, situational ethics is probably the term that I use most often. When I talk about objective morality, I just mean that it's not just subject to your whim or any subjective experience. Because one of the objections we get when you say you don't want to put your hand in a wood chipper, somebody will come along and say, well, somebody might want to do that. Who are you to decide what's right for them? We're speaking in general rules. We are physical beings in a physical universe with rules that dictate what the consequences of our actions and, are. And, and if there really were a masochist who wanted to yeah. do that, there, there would be a complete scientific understanding of masochism that's possible. Yeah, sure. And it's possible that there's a way of being a masochist that, uh, that admits of equivalent well-being, say. I, I, I highly doubt this is the case, but let's say that was the case. So, it, so having right and wrong answers to questions of morality, and this is why I use this analogy of a moral landscape, it doesn't mean there's just one right answer right. for everybody. There's, there could be many, many, a functionally infinite number of peaks on this landscape, but there are even more wrong answers. There's a larger infinite set of wrong answers, and you know when you're not on a peak and because of your hand is in the wood chipper, and it, it turns out you're not one of those masochists who likes it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the one question that, keeps, that you've been hammered with, that I've been hammered with, uh, is, oh, you're talking about objective morality, but your foundation of morality is well-being. Now, when it comes to the is up problem, uh, I jokingly and fallaciously pointed out that I, you, you may not be able to get from an is to an ought, but I can get from two is's to an ought. Because if I know what the goal is and I know what the consequences of my action is, or the consequence of my action is, right. then I can tell what I ought to do to achieve that goal, which was a good way to sum it up. There's a problem in there that I'm not going to get into. But I liked, I, I believe I understand what you assessed in moral landscape, which, which was kind of my view of this is, oh, what, under what basis, what objective basis have you decided that well-being is the standard? And I think you said, what other standard could there be? I, you know, like if they, that's the thing about secular moral systems is they have at their foundation the goal of getting better, getting better. And even if I pick three premises that are going to serve, I can pick them arbitrarily. Death is preferable to life. And you can work through and do thought experiments to see, does that get you towards a better world? But all this little bickering about better world, who defines better, what's better, well-being, has anybody in all, up from your detractors, suggested another non-God's dictate, divine command, foundation that would be better than well-being? And if they did, how would you respond? Well, there's, there's two ironies here. One is that the religious answer is also predicated on well-being. I mean, the, when you ask religious people, why, what's wrong with going to hell for eternity? It's, right? it's because it's too hot there. Yeah. Right? Like, like you, you don't want to be there. Heaven is much better. You're, you're the, it's a story about some eternal circumstance of well-being or its antithesis that awaits us after death. Now, if that were true, if there was good reason to believe in the Christian heaven or the, or the, the Muslim paradise, I would be first, uh, the first to say that it's really important to live so as to, to place the right bet on eternity. I mean, it's, they could, you know, what's 70 years compared to eternity of suffering or happiness? But it just so happens that there's no good reason to believe in, in those after-death states. But they're still talking about consciousness and its contents and, and, well, and the difference between misery and, and well-being. And for me, the, the, the definition of well-being is truly open-ended. It's there to be refined and, and further discovered. And I think there's, there, are, there are possibilities of well-being that we can't imagine. The other irony here is that People are at, when people say that you, you have this assumption that well-being is, is good or, or worth finding, uh, as though we could do otherwise, as though having an axiom at the bottom here makes this unscientific. Every science is based on similar axioms that can't justify themselves. So, so take, for example, assuming that the universe is intelligible, right? 
assuming that two plus two makes four for every two and two. You know, if it works for apples, it works for oranges, it's also going to work for cantaloupes. How do you know it's going to work for ravens and chickens? And how does it generalize? That's an, intu that, that's an intuition, right? That's a foundational well, it's, it's intuition. It's still an that assumption that you need to test, itself. though. In, in physics, I mean, I think you... But you don't test it by continuing to count apples and oranges and cantaloupes. Well, we do things like that. We, you know, there's, we, do, we do check to see if the rules continue to work in places we haven't looked before. But the idea that events have causes. Yeah, well, right? uh, yeah unless, unless time begins and then there was no cause because there was no before. Right, but, but, that, but that's proffered as a violation of our intuition yeah, that works okay. everywhere else in science. Well, right? yeah, but I mean, I'm just, in some sense, playing the devil's advocate in this regard. But, but violation of You're intuition, have to assume in my field, violation of intuition is everything. What was that? In my field, violation of intuition is everything. Except the least trusty, th worthy thing you have is intuition. Yeah, no, but you're, you're using other intuitions to get behind the bad ones. You're using, in, this ca in most cases, mathematical intuitions to I get behind I'm bad I'm common I'm a real sense. empiricist. I, I, I really am a theorist, but, I, but theory is highly suspect. Empirical evidence is the only thing that works for me. Right, well, so, but the, the example I always use here, forgive me if you've heard it, but it just it makes the point, is that this is how you're using intuitions to get behind other intuitions. If you ask people if they could fold a piece of newspaper a hundred times onto, onto itself a hundred times, you ask them how thick it would be, most people have the intuition that it would be something like 12 inches thick. And it, yet it, the real object would be light years across if you could fold a piece of paper. So you can't fold a piece of paper, no matter how big it exactly. is. Exactly, you can't, right? yeah. because it would be light years across. It's like you fold it, you can fold it like seven times or so. Seven so, but the, but the way you get there is you have... You I don't your, think it's a property of how big it is, by the way, just so you know. What was that? I don't think it's a property of no, how big it is. No, the, the, there's an intuition that... that it, yeah, that, no, but that a bigger do doesn't help in this regard. But anyway, right. it doesn't yes. matter. Yes, well... Bigger size doesn't matter. Let me make that clear. Anyway. But you're, <laughs> the reason why you trust the math mm -hmm. is because you have a very strong intuition that has been backed up by... I mean, you, you haven't because run it, the experiment. Because it works. Well, no, but, it, but you, haven't, you haven't... You know that exponentiation works. You know that two times two gets you four, and you do it again and it gets you eight, but you haven't got, it, maybe it just peters out at some point. You know, at a certain we, point, we rely, one, there's, maybe there's one power of two that doesn't work. Yeah, no, so, but, but right. no, so the way it works, it's more subtle. I don't know whether we can get into this, but in science, you know, not, in principle, it, there are no absolutes. So there, and that's why I don't like to use the word believe. We've used it three times or four times on stage already, and we, I think we should banish that word. No, yeah, we so fixed this when we were in Toronto. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I know. We've been, but, but here's the idea, is that, is that things are either likely or unlikely. And they're either really likely, and we say they're true, and, but we've kind of... Right. In, in a, but there really means that the probability prob is are so you large that it's that based on our experience that it's so large that we don't even ask the question, is the sun going to rise tomorrow? It's highly likely. Are, are you uh, convinced that everything is either likely or unlikely? Well, it's either likely or unlikely. That's You're convinced it. of that. What? You're convinced that there's a high likelihood of that fact. <laughs> okay. Clever, clever, but, but that's wait, not who in you the were context a ago. that I would use the word belief. It's not I am convinced of something without it. It just means I'm convinced of something, and then we assess Probably how and why I'm. And and to go along with Hume, it's about a confidence level. I proportion my confidence level to the evidence that supports it. So I'm behind you on all the empirical evidence. I'm not going to throw the word believe out just because it gets. Uh, into hairy territories of uncertainty because that's the world we live in. It, it, I think it's just an, doesn't I mean, help. No, knowledge term. is, I think the distinction between belief and knowledge in the way we use those terms is the one you just drew. It, it, it's the, the matter of uh, your confidence. If you think Again, I think the think only form of knowledge is empirical evidence. There's no other forms of knowledge. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure evidence. we're sitting here having this conversation right now. And that, so that's, this is empirical evidence, right? Like I, but it's, it's possible that it's a dream. Yeah. You know, I've had those dreams. I've had dreams where I was telling someone just like you, listen, I, if I'm sure of anything, we're sitting here having this conversation. <laughs> and then I woke up. Right? They're, they're called nightmares. And, and, and I remember the person had a very bemused look on his face <laughs> yeah. before I woke up. I want to have your dreams. <laughs> My dreams are about some of the callers to the show on occasion. And but, but, but it's that, but uh, belief, faith, uh, that's one, I, I want to jump on something else. I'm trying to think of things that will upset some audience members. Um, uh, the, uh, so when you quoted Hume, and, and, and I, there was a really interesting point, you pointed said said some ridiculous things. And um, 
That is one of my problems with quoting philosopher first, okay? Philosophers say reasonable things, as do physicists, and stupid things. And, and what I find is this problem of claiming, just because someone says something very reasonable, that they're become an authority is a real problem for me. Because, you know, he was writing at a time we knew very little about physics or consciousness. And so there are no scientific authorities. And I really always, it's, it's, you know, it's great to quote people, great, liter, great literature, great philosophers, but not then to say, um, you know, some people like Aristotle. I've never been as big a fan of Aristotle as some people. Um, and, but, you know, he, he said some good things, but he also said women and men have a different number of teeth. He could have discovered it by opening a mouth, okay? And so, you know, I'm always wary about this authority that I, when I have that discussion with some philosophers, they say, oh, but so-and-so said. Uh, see, that drives me crazy. So for reference, whenever I quote a philosopher, it's not uh, as a citation of authority. It's a recognition that they expressed long ago and far better than me the thing that I'm trying to explain. And, and, and I'm, this isn't a casting aspersions on you, but almost everything you say has been expressed long ago Far better than you, by, by yes. <laughs> no, no. I mean, we all have to realize that. We, we, we. I mean, it's amazing to. Uh, the more I study both history and science, it's amazing to see how how many of the things we talk about are anticipated by interesting people early on. Yeah. So, what would be that the, your last belief, conviction, intuition to go? What, what, what's the what's the the premise which, if it came into conflict with data? you would be most tempted to say, well, there must be something wrong with the data. Hmm. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess in my own existence. Be- because I have a personal reason to want to exist, probably. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's probably... That r- is so, I, mean, I, mean, I, I translate that as just that consciousness is, is here and seems, I mean, something seems to be happening. Yeah, I, I mean, I, look, I guess I'd have to say, and I was going to use the word believe, except I just made a point of saying we shouldn't. Um, <laughs> that... My, 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 my whole being is based on the fact that there's an objective reality. I mean, my, everything I do in my life and my work is based on that. And so the assumption that there is no object, objective reality is something that I would have a hard, I guess would be the hardest thing for me to give up. I like to think for rational reasons, but I also think it's probably passion as well. What about you? Well, it's, it's close to that. I mean, it is the... Actually, the two premises that have just come up, one is that consciousness exists, whatever it is. It's just, again, it, we, yeah. we could be living in a simulation. If the simulation There's a lot of good reasons to think we're not, by the yes, way. Yes, no, I, yeah. I, I, would, I would grant you that, but even that wouldn't violate that, what I'm calling consciousness. Consciousness, clearly, the fact that something seems to be happening, whether this is a dream, whether it's a simulation, whether it's... But if we're in a simulation, point. there'd still be consciousness. And that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So like, the, the, consciousness is the one thing that can't be an illusion, though everything else could be an illusion. What, well, I guess I have to ask, what do you mean by illusion? I mean, if something... Not, not it, actually there when you think it's there in, in this Well, but if, it, but if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, if, if, if the world is set up so that everything that happens based on the assumption that it's there happens, then that's yes. indistinguishable from, from constantly being fooled, right? Well, I'm just saying the one thing you can't be fooled about is, I mean, you, you put it in terms of your own existence. Mm-hmm. I think there are things about your existence that you could be fooled about. For instance, you could think you have a body where you really don't, or you could think the body has a certain character where it really doesn't. You could think you have free will where you really don't. I mean, there are many people in that situation, and we, we've mm-hmm. talked about that. <laughs> uh, you could think you have a self. I mean, many people, I have spent some time talking about this. Many people are walking around with a feeling of self, that I think is an illusion. But consciousness is the context in which all veridical and non-veridical perceptions can arise. And so, so consciousness for me If I can be the, the douchey philosopher quoting dude for a moment. Yeah. Uh, in a way, Sam, Sam is echoing Descartes' cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Basically, the whole point is that... Except for the I at, part. And, yeah, well, see... <laughs> and I would, I would say that the, the very idea of an act of consciousness is contingent upon an I, upon a self. Now, that, there we may disagree, like we're about to disagree on free will in a moment. Um, oh, spoiler alert. Uh, but the thing that you will hate, and I will agree with you, despite being a philosophy geek, is I think it was Hobbes who pointed out to Descartes that his cogito was based on an assumption that reason was reasonable. 
Now, my friend Aaron Ra has been complaining lately that every time he gets into a debate with a theist of some stripe, that as he keeps pushing them back further and further, not only do they begin their appeals to faith, which is no justification for anything, but they then begin to question reality at all. Like, how do you know that reason is reasonable? Yeah, you have no foundation for it. It's Oy, a, that's a genuine Oy, this problem. Is why, that's why I do field. physics, because, you know... Yeah. It, it, <laughs> You can argue about that forever, but we can figure out how the world works. I mean, you it think you're doing <laughs> physics, but uh, no. But much of what you do in physics, at least in quantum mechanics, is remain agnostic about what's really going on. I mean, so, so it's, for instance, differentiating the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics from some other variant. You, you can be non-committal there, and they, they have very different pictures of reality. Yeah, but we you can talked just say a little the bit the math on works your podcast, the but. Works. Yeah. Yes and no. The problem with the many worlds interpretation and other interpretations of quantum mechanics is there are interpretations. And it's a real problem f for me that people... So the real world is quantum mechanical, at least as far as we can tell. And all classical interpretations are just approximations of that quantum mechanical world. So they're all going to be wrong. But, we, but, as but a, they're different. The late they're... physicist Sidney Coleman, who was the smartest guy when I was at Harvard and is now deceased, but wonderful. So we should really be talking about the interpretations of classical mechanics, because it's the, the world we live in is this approximation to reality. So we should be talking about how to interpret that in terms of the underlying reality, in terms of, instead of talking about how to interpret the underlying reality in, in terms of something that's just clearly wrong. But, but... Well, there's one physicist yeah, yeah. in the audience. <laughs> one person who understood what you were saying. My former, I have a former student who's out there somewhere, so you better be clapping. Right. Okay. <laughs> but these pictures are genuinely incommensurable. So if you're going to take many worlds uh -huh. and say, this is the picture of reality as we think it to be, that there's a functionally infinite number of parallel universes where you and I are having decreasingly similar conversations to the one we're having right now, beings just like us, thinking the same thoughts, but with you know, one atom tweaked. Mm -hmm. That's a very different picture than David Bohm's interpretation or the Copenhagen interpretation. Yeah, or, but as I say, they're all just interpretations. But, but yeah, but that's what, when we feel we understand something in science or in, 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 in any other area of cognition, we, uh, we have an interpretation that we think is mapping on to reality. So it's like, just, to, just walk it back a little bit and say, take molecular biology. We think we know what's going on inside a cell. And which means we think that if we could, and some of these experiments have almost been done, that we could you know, virtually get a video camera into a cell and look at genes transcribing, right? And, and so we see the machinery that is, it is classical, you know, and it's... Well, it, it, well it's, that, it's that is because you're finding cell the water sizes when you still, it. But the smaller, smaller sizes, it isn't. But, yeah, but, that, but, but my but point is that's where this, it's violating We have this interpretation that guides There's no doubt that scientists have have an interpretation that guides them, but the whole point is to constantly be checking that to see if that interpretation is wrong or if, if the consequence oh, no, of that interpretation... No, no. So you have constantly have to second-guess yourself, and that's really important because when you get to new things, is usually, usually is when you're just, just surprised and something you assume to be natural or, or, or normal turns out not to be. Yeah. And that's when really great scientific discoveries are made, is when that interpretation gets... Gets, gets set aside or, or, or confronts reality, a reality that you never knew existed. But that, that's a, another way of echoing Matt's concern, which is, or your friend's concern, which is reason, what we call reason, is an evolved property which may not be a sharp enough tool to get at every corner of reality that we want to understand. We have, we have commonsensical notions of, like the law of non-contradiction, right? Something can't both be and not be a, an X, right? Well, yeah, but except but, in physics, it's exactly. all the time. Yeah, exactly. so that's the point. No, it doesn't. Right. Our, 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 our reason, as Richard Dawkins has said many times we've been together, was we evolved on the savannas in Africa to escape lions and not to understand quantum mechanics. Yeah. And it's a, it, it's a fortunate, for some of us, a fortunate aside that we, a, a consequence of that somehow that we have developed mathematics and physics. So reason, I never understand when people say, uh, and I had this debate with, yeah, well, William Clinton Craig, among others, but somehow classical reason and logic govern, you know, should guide our notions. And the point is that it's classical reason and logic, when it comes to the world, are often wrong because our notions of classical reason and logic are based on our experience. No. And the no? 
Okay, tell me why. So I hear, I hear, this, I hear this a lot, and, and here's the best short, quick explanation that I can come up with. When, I, when we talk about uh, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, don't think of those as if they are defining what something is. They represent the, the, a descriptor of a sim, single circled Venn diagram. Everything's either in the circle or outside the circle, but it doesn't tell you what the circle is. The but it's not true. Electrons it, are in it, the circle and outside the circle. No, because now you're defining in the circle as this is where the electron is. It's a fail. So if the circle represented apples, everything is either an apple or it's not an apple. It can't both be an apple and not an apple at the same time and in the same way, which is the extension of that. When we talk about you know, electrons being in two places at once and instead of where or something's quantum in multiple states. All that means is that the definition of that is now everything is either quantum or not quantum. Because the laws of logic don't tell you anything about what something is. They are just the framework that allows us to begin to categorize things. So you're not violating it by coming up with a definition that is contrary to our intuitions. Hey, something can't be here and here at the same time. That's our intuition. That so is not a problem. You're telling me that logic it. has to be redefined. Okay, let me get your applause. There's the three philosophers. Yeah. But if you tell me that your logic has to be defined based on what we discover about reality, fine. We redefine what we mean by logic and reason as we learn more about the universe. But that's take, take a very simple case. I mean, this is this is an intuition. It's not quite a logical intuition, but we have a very strong intuition that there is a now, and simultaneity is a real thing. So, but I it mean, isn't. So, uh, that's, I agree. I'm you your, your line as a physicist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you just came in too early. So, I left my wallet in, 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 in this universe. Me. So my two fingers snap at the same time here. That must be good enough for the universe. That is, there, that is the now, and yet you can tell us how velocity... Well, Simultaneity only applies to here, not yeah. there. That's the point. If we're all in the same place, if I'm sitting on your lap and I won't... Um, uh, <laughs> And, and we snap our fingers and we're in the same place and ever, we have a now. But we just have to realize that my now is not your now, just like it's not your now. Not least because the sound system takes time for you to hear us. But if I'm looking at you, the light takes time. And so I can never be in two places at once as a classical being. And therefore, anything that happens there is never in my now. It's always then. I can never experience now in more than one place. And that's what Einstein realized to make it... To, him realize that when we assume that there's a universal now, we're wrong. And moreover, there are conditions in the universe when some people are traveling very fast, where in fact, it's quite clear that my now is not your now. And so the, well, the sequence can be reversed. Yeah, the sequence yeah. can be reversed. It's, yeah. a, it's a kind of catch-22. Future and past can be reversed, but only by an amount such that cause and effect can never be screwed up. Every cause, if I, something is the cause of something for one person, it's the cause of that thing for every people. It's an amazing catch-22 of the universe. God was merciful there. Yeah. Merciful and, yes, exactly. And it, it won't surprise you, but I'm in complete agreement. I think th this idea, we have intuitions about the world. Like, even, even when we're trying to do silence, uh, science, and you say uh, T0, as if you could come up with a discrete marker in time. And not only do you not experience that, but there's no reason to think that you could do that. You know, when you tend to things like Zeno's paradox of let me divide this down, I can divide it. What's the smallest unit? There are no units of time uh, that, that are the construct of time. We apply seconds, what minutes. Is this, what is the standard, if there is a standard view in physics, take much of what we say about time and the notion of a block universe. What is physical thinking? Well, you know, it's a long discussion. I think yeah. people get hung up on time a little little too much because, I mean, you don't have this problem with space and time and space are, are tied together in, 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 in physics completely, yeah. in, in special relativity and general relativity. Time is much more difficult to picture than space and there are interesting questions about time that we don't have the answer to, such as you can go in a circle in space, but can you go in a circle in time? And if that's the case, you know, then it addresses issues of causality and all of that. Many of us think they're probably physical arguments why you, in sensible universes you can't do a circle in time. But I don't see it as... I, I know there's been books written about time, but I, I, for a physicist, it just... It's space and time are this playing field on which events happen. But, and that's but it. do events really happen? Is there, <laughs> is there really such a thing as a sequence of events, or is there just a, a totality... 
that's sort of viewed from outside of time? It's an, it, well, it's an interesting question, and, and it has to do with things we don't understand. Whether in, in, in a, if quantum mechanics is applied to general relativity, then in some sense time, as you see it, is a, is a consequence of your specific existence within a, within, within a certain quantum wave function. But in, but in the meta, in the meta quantum gravity world, time is an illusion. And that sounds neat, but we don't really have a, a theory of quantum gravity, so I think we have to leave that question open, just like we don't yet know. When, when I said you don't have problems with space, you don't. But we don't understand space either, because sp at some fundamental level, space, gravity, quantum, general relativity is a theory of space and time. And if quantum mechanics applies to general relativity, then our notions of space as well as time have to change. And we don't have, and some people think they have an inkling of an answer with string theory, and they're probably wrong. But uh, not to cast aspersions on string theory, although I do, uh, <laughs> but, but just simply what people have to realize is that most ideas are wrong. Most really good ideas are wrong in science. And so it would be very surprising if this very bold idea, which is very well motivated, don't get me wrong, actually were right. And so far there's no in my opinion, there's no empirical evidence that it is right in any way that it relates to the world we live in. But so therefore, I don't understand time as much as I don't understand space at some fundamental microscopic level. Yeah. And, and I'm fine not understanding it. It's, it's why I go to work every day. I desperately need to, uh, yes. Oh, I didn't do it for a while. So I'm happy that we're, we're doing three more of these because uh, we're not going to get to the one topic that I wanted to get to tonight because I'm told that it's time to line up for questions. So Great. if we can start bringing the house lights up, did you? And, and you can. Great. You didn't get well, to. Did, you know did, why you didn't get? You know why you didn't get to free will? Because you had no choice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, no, no free will. Name, we don't name have time. that topic so that if someone is sure, curious about that topic, there was going to be a we'll discussion ask, about free will sure. because I am well, there's an a audience compatibilist. Uh, yeah, there's people out there. I'm a compatibilist, a la Dennett, and they are not. And, uh, you know, I like, I figure two to versus one, it should be fun. Uh, and I'm sure it'll come up at different times, and, and we're going to talk yeah. about it a bunch over the course of this. But uh, someone may yet ask about it. I, I could listen to both of you for ages, which is why I'm very happy that we're going to continue doing these events. But we want to make sure that you get the questions so that it's not all about me asking questions. I appreciate the person who said keep talking, though, because that's my favorite thing. Uh, so we'll, we'll alternate, and if you could just say your name and a couple notes. Questions end in a question mark. Do not begin with your life story or dissertation. Please remember that there are many people waiting to ask questions. I have a call-in show. I have a call-in show with a hold button and a hang-up button, and if you think I won't hang up on your ass live on stage, you are much mistaken. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Carter. And I want to thank all of you for thinking out loud in public, which is the way that Sam's describing it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming. Sam, Sam was thinking. I was just talking. OK. That's right. It all sounded good to me. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm going to jump into the free will discussion. Um, I've heard you say, Sam, many times you have obviously no control over the circumstances in which you're born. You have no control over your genetic code. We live in a deterministic world. I'm just curious from a practical perspective, and it sounds like we have at least one compatibilist on stage. Can you take pride of ownership or authorship over anything, and do you? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. I, I think pride is worth outgrowing, certainly. I, 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 think, I think there's a, an, as, an asymmetry between pride and shame and regret, uh, other social emotions there, which seem predicated on the same illusion, but not so much. I, I think you can, and again, it, it, how you think as an adult is not exactly the same as what I think you should encourage your children to think. It's not a matter of lying to children. It's just there are certain things that we as adults understand about the world that we don't insist that little kids understand, and for good reason, because it would be you know, terrifying or destabilizing or not allow them to get the cognitive and emotional tools we want them to get. So I th but I think pride is, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't feel pride about anything, really. When I look at how things happen, it's just I, I have whatever advantages I have, I have whatever opportunities I have, I have the, this, there's such a massive role of luck, whatever luck actually is, 
just to have been born in a society that basically works, surrounded by people who are not killing one another, always, right? I mean, it's, it's just, you, you know, you, you, you can't take responsibility. You didn't build the roads, right? I mean, all, all, these, all these self-made people who are walking around saying, I did it myself, there were a million things that allowed them to do whatever they did. And again, you didn't pick your parents, you didn't sculpt your genes, so you can't take credit for anything. And that doesn't mean that effort doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that there isn't a proximate cause of intention and desire in each moment to, to getting things done. But you can't really take credit for it uh, in each moment if you're paying attention to how it's happening. Yeah. It, is it okay if I add something? Because yeah. all the questions will be for Sam anyway. I'll add, in, I'll add something. Um, uh, well, I, I know that Sam and I generally agree about free will because we're, we're right and you're wrong. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, we'll but, see. The, but the whole point is, that, in my, my version, is that, is that the, the world is essentially, for all intents and purposes, indistinguishable from a world in which there's free will. So I think we do, we, we, by practical necessity, take responsibility for actions, even if we realize, as we do, that, 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 that there are a host of factors beyond our control that determine those actions. But, but we as a society and as individuals need to function because the world appears to be a world in which, uh, as I say, for all intents and purposes, is indistinguishable from a world with free will. But, but, when but we it, need when to take say, responsibility for actions. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, that means, not, I'm not talking about punishment, but I'm to, or necessarily pride, but, but we might as well, if we don't take responsibility for our actions, we're, we're just uh, ultimately divorcing ourselves from, a, from the world as it practically appears. This is a genuine point of confusion, I think, for people. Nothing I've said suggests that you can't take responsibility yeah, sure, for actions or that. that I can't hold you responsible. But when we, you actually look at what you mean when you say uh, you're going to hold someone responsible for their actions, it's for those actions where holding them responsible has, a, has an effect on their behavior. You know? And other people, and social exactly. people. Yeah. We incarcerate some people if we were doing it right, not because to punish them, but because with a social contract, we're trying to make sure society functions, but, but and punishment. ideally trying to help them function it's better within society. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's an, a robot that's gone bad or somebody with free will. This is the agent that took the action, and something needs to be done to prevent it from going on. I'm in agreement with both of you on what... So this is the thing. The nonprofits did a three-and-a-half-hour podcast one time with four of us arguing about free will. Uh, and we, in the end, we all agreed on exactly what we do and don't have. We just disagreed on what to call it. For me, what most people care about with free will is not whether I could have done something differently, not whether my actions were predetermined by the physical laws of the universe. It is I, as a thinking agent, have desires. And am I being impeded from fulfilling those desires? And I don't mean in a simple sense, like I desire to fly and the laws of the universe won't let me flap my wings and do it. I mean, Sam could get up and walk off and jump off this stage, or I could drag Sam and throw him off the stage. At the end, he's both situations, he's down there. The difference between him as an agent alone taking that action of his own volition and me as an agent imposing my volition over his, the difference between those two actions, I think, summarizes everything people care about free will. It's not everything, though. Uh, no. people, all right, people, the, the bulk of what people care it's about. It's not even the bulk. It's people right. legitimately. I, I, feel. I think I agree with Sam on yeah. this one. I, I, okay, what, what do they care about that free will it, that is not it, encapsulated? It's that I could have done otherwise. I could have done that better. I just screwed okay. up. I could have done, I, I, yeah. I could have not screwed up. And, and the idea that you could, if you rewound the movie of your life, you could sink the putt. So I think say that people... the thing that you forgot to say. Everything that, that gives motivation to the feeling of regret. Yeah, but, but this, is, this, is a, this is, has to do with the way people's brains have been poisoned about how to think about free will. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not just being facetious there. This is... But you're talking when about I how, say... how most people think about free will. And I, I'm saying okay, but I, I think that there, there's a subtler thing to this. When I say I could have done differently, I don't mean if I rewound the universe, I would have done differently. That seems to me to be an exercise in training oneself in how to act in future situations that are similar. Yes, yes. Okay? I agree with you. Uh, I, when you say that people care about they could have done otherwise, I'm not convinced that that's the case because when people talk about free will, they're talking about morality, they're talking about how, holding agents' action. They're talking about it not quite in the sense of, of freedom of expression, freedom of my volition, uh, but it's far closer to that, I think. But even if you're right, 
even if what most people want free will to be is that I could have done otherwise, that has no bearing on whether there is some variety of free will independent of what people want or some labeling categorizing that we value as free will, which not to quote a philosopher, but Dennett, um, the, the subtitle to one of his books was The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. And I'm always cautious to make sure we all agree there's no such thing as libertarian free will. The, the, the idea that I could have done differently or rewind yeah. it. I think that because people have been trained to think a specific way about free will and only this counts as free will, that we're overlooking a variety of free will. I just think does calling it a free will is, is misleading. I mean, you can yeah. call it whatever you want, but... Well, that's, that's the thing. Three and a half hours and we all agreed on what we had, but not what to call it. Well, no, but I, I think there are genuine differences that Dan and I... I mean, Dan and I have not been able to resolve our differences on this point for some reason, you know, and, and so there's, it's not that we totally agree and we're just using this one word differently. We have different intuitions about this. I think I can speak fairly for Dan here. He thinks the idea that free will is on any level an illusion is a, a dangerous thing to believe. And, it, and we spread that meme at our peril. And, and by the way, I don't think yeah, that. And I, and I actually think, I think that's, I guess, potentially dangerous for somebody, but I think it's, it's a net positive for most people. to see. I, I am not the slightest bit concerned about the potential danger of people thinking or not thinking that they have free no, will. No, some people find it genuinely destabilizing. I mean, no, no, I forgot to do it here, but normally when I talk about the illusion of free will, I issue a little you know, fine print disclaimer at the beginning saying, you know, if what I'm about to say makes you feel weird, you know, go, go to the bar and we'll hang out later. A lot of people, a lot of people feel incredibly disappointed when they come to believe that there's no, no longer believe that there's a God. Um, but, but I think that's the great, I'm um, again, coming up back to science, I've said it before to kids, the great thing, and education, forget science, the great thing about education and thinking and experiencing is that ideas that you hold incredibly dear that are central to your being are proved wrong. That's what makes life worth living, and that's the value of science, is that, is that we should all be willing to, to find those things around. And, and for the record, before we, uh, for the record, before we on, go on to the other question, I'm sure we'll talk more about it. Uh, I know that, that Dan, I read your book, Free Will, um, and I, the only fault that I had with the entire book was when you discussed compatibilism, because I yeah. think you said something along the lines of, but it, had, have you read the subsequent back and forth? Between I did. And Dan? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, but grant, the, granted, I gave it short shrift in the book, but Dan and I have had a lot of opportunity to converge uh, here, and we haven't yet done it, both publicly and privately. And yeah, so it's And I'm not him. I'm just saying that in the book, what you said about compatibilism was, I, f I think, and, you, and correct me, something along the lines of compatibilists are like redefining free will to suit themselves. Something along those lines. That, well, I, I said, I think the thing that, most annoyed Dan was I said, compatibilism is every puppet is free as long as it learns to love its strings. <laughs> Something like that. And Dan, I have But wouldn't a puppet that loved its strings therefore be conscious? And No, I'm just... Uh, that, was, that was the only thing I had in the book because I agree with you that compatibilists are redefining classical definitions or, or they are coming up with a definition for free will that I think matches what is real, not that I could have done otherwise. Well, that's fine. My only issue with Dan is that it's not acknowledging how seditious that is with respect to what most people are walking around believing. It really is a, it is not the free will. The free will worth wanting is not the free will that most people think they have. And Which there, is and, and independent from whether or not we have the free will worth wanting. Well, no, but, but again, I'm just saying to call it free will is misleading there. Because, I mean, Dan will say we're all moist robots, right? That's a surprise to most people. But I mean, so there's a genuine, at least there's one genuine paradox here for me with respect to free will. And when Dan and I wrote back and forth about this, I described it in terms of Tiger Woods missing a putt, right? And, and mm -hmm. here's the, here's the, the genuine, and I don't even know what I think about this yet. I just, it seems to me to be a kind of moral paradox. When you take the person who should be most competent to do something, uh, again, to use the putt analogy because it's so simple, you know, I'm a bad golfer. If I miss a three-foot putt, it's no big surprise. Mm -hmm. You're not going to hold me so responsible for missing it because I'm just the kind of golfer who's going to miss it some considerable percentage of time. But with someone like Tiger Woods or whoever is the best golfer these days, if anyone should make it, that person should make it. And so when, but when he misses it or she misses it, 
it says the least about the person. They're, in fact, they're the least responsible. It's the most anomalous circumstance. When Tiger Woods misses a three-foot putt, that's just some error in the system. It's like if I, so you're, you're a physicist. Mm -hmm. If I ask you, you know, what's the second law of thermodynamics? And right now, you can't tell me, right? You don't know. You've completely forgotten. That, that is a total anomaly. That's not okay. you being most responsible. If anyone should know, you should know. But if you don't know right now, we're going to think you had a stroke or you know, the, so, something bad happened. Yeah, I don't know whether I like it's that analogy quiz, by the way. at all. Because, yeah. uh, no, not just because of, no, because, um, it's the food again, portion. I think of it as, I, see, I don't see all these no, paradoxes. No, no, when every imagine, time Tiger Woods makes a putt, wait, wait, there's wait, a probability wait. it's going to go in. There's a probability it's not going. It's, very, it's much more likely for Tiger Woods than you. But right. it's not 100%. Okay, but, we, but to say that he should have made it. Like, what so do you we, mean by that? Because you're a trained physicist. Right? I hope so. And I ask you, I ask you what, what, to, to explain the second law of thermodynamics. And right now, if you have no idea... Right, and then you come off stage, and 15 minutes later, you say, "Oh God, I remember what it is. I should have been able to answer the question." It's understandable that you would be kicking yourself, but in your case, someone who who knows this as much as he knows that that he has hands, mm -hmm. it's the most anomalous failure. It's not. It's it, yeah. it's it's very strange to hold you responsible for it. It would be completely mysterious in your case. And so, but so when you map that onto morality, you have someone who's imp who's impeccably moral, right? Mm -hmm who would not hurt a fly, he, always tell, he or she always tells the truth, but then this person wakes up tomorrow morning and starts you know, beheading children, that is the least in character. This is the person who we would hold most responsible mm -hmm. because he's the most capable of being responsible. In this this is in line with like Charles Whitman and the, and the tumor. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but he's not, right. I mean, if, if that had been St. Francis with a tumor, yeah. But I guess, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm... I just too, it strikes me I'm as a too, paradox. Not, like, where I'm is responsibility games. if you can't I'm, find I'm it? I'm a physicist, so I, sophisticated things go beyond me. But, but um, the, the, uh, the whole, people, I guess the whole point, which is, is that people are human, right? And therefore, therefore hence, uh, you can't expect... doubt about, about free will or, or the doubt about the claim that responsibility runs very, very deep in each moment. Yeah, and, and, and people, is everyone, is gonna, everyone is going to, because of the fact that we're human and, that, and we're not free to have chosen anything else, uh, we are going to do unexpected things what, uh, that we may feel we have no control over or we may feel we do have control over. That feeling is an illusion, but we are going to do unexpected things. So I accept that and big deal. But it is a big deal because you can really have a lot of compassion for flawed humanity. Yeah, no, that, that's where I think, that's where I was just going to get to earlier. The really, while it may make people feel uncomfortable, as I'm sure people are feeling right now by wasting so much time talking about free will, but, but, um, uh, the, no, but the good part about it is, the really good part of that discomfort is the fact that we begin to have compassion yeah. and we begin to think less in societal terms about punishment and more about uh, uh, living in, in harmony in some ways. And so I think that's a really important aspect of this, is to realize that there are factors that lead people to do things. And it doesn't mean they're not responsible if they kill someone, but it means that, that the whole notion of punishment, in my mind, goes out the window. Unless there are cases where but maybe, punishment really works, and it's the only thing that works, and it's necessary that it work for that thing. Well, I, I, empirically, if you call it punishment, yeah. I mean, and, uh, you know... But the idea that people ostracism. really deserve, to, in a retributional sense, that what they get, that's, hmm. that's suspect. I think operationally, yeah. I, mean, I don't know whether retribution is that... But let, in, let's say primitive societies have ostracism, which works very well as a way of... I, I, uh, but, but anyway, I would right. rather... Now, no, I, I, I want to go on. I want to say one thing, if you'll allow me to be a little difficult to stick a pin in something. When you say compatibilists uh, are not talking about free will in the same way that other people are, I think the same argument can be made towards us, that we're not talking about morality, or that compatibilists are talking about free will not in the way that other people are. That we're not talking about morality the same way other people are, because I think the bulk of history, people have wanted there to be an absolute answer, an absolute right answer. And when we both acknowledge that there are perhaps multiple right answers, this departs from what people think of morality. And I think compatibilists may be doing something similar with free will, and the fact that they've departed doesn't mean that there's not something that we could valuably and usefully call for. But I, I think this all comes down to the same point, which will allow us to hopefully segue out. Um, that, uh, and, and Sam alluded to earlier that, that our notions, and what, again, science, 
there are words. We use words, but words are imprecise. And T.S. You know, mm-hmm. Eliot said that one. And the words are imprecise. And science changes the meaning of words because, and by science, I mean empirical evidence learning about the world. I've, I have non-stop discussions with people about nothing, okay, since I wrote that book. And, and people are upset by the fact that science has changed the definition of nothing. They say, you're not allowed to change the definition. And I say, I call that learning. And, uh, and, and so I think all these notions of free will and morality will evolve as we learn more about cognition and, and the way humans work. And that'll be fine. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. I couldn't agree more violently. Thank you. All right, that's a good segue. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. Hi, my name's Greg. Um, Christopher Hitchens once said to uh, Sean Hannity, you sound an awful lot to me like someone who's never heard the argument against your own position. And with today's social media echo chambers, it feels like that's becoming more and more of a problem. Sure. What do we do to combat this? How do we get people to be interested in finding out if they're full of crap? <laughs> well, let me, let me jump in. and I, I, I think the problem is, is really, really basic. I mean, for, you know, the Internet is part of the problem because you can choose. We all thought it'd be great because it gives you open access to information. There were only three channels when I grew up, and you'd get your news from, you know, David Brinkley or Walter Cronkite or whatever. And wouldn't it be great to be able to not have that news filter? But in fact, without a filter, then you have access to everything. And unless you have an innate filter, then you're often going to choose people who agree with what you haven't said in the beginning. And so this is maybe going to sound trite, but I really do believe it's the case. We, it comes to has to do with a deep problem in my mind about how we teach in schools. We teach... Okay, just wait. You may not agree with me, so just wait. Um, when I was growing up, and still teach things as if teaching is teaching a bunch of facts. And we have to give people a certain number of facts and they can become adults. But that's not what teaching should be about. It should be... Science is not a bunch of facts. It's a process for deriving facts. And what we need to do in the current world is not teach the facts, but the process. Because in, in, in you know, I didn't bring my phone out here because I knew I'd be reading it while we were talking. But, um, uh, but uh, you know, there's more information in my iPhone than there, and, and more misinformation than I could ever get from school. So th- that's irrelevant. What we need is to teach people how to distinguish fact from fiction. I call that science, but it's a process of empirical discovery, questioning, skepticism. And so I think we should be teaching with questioning not with a bunch of facts, making it a process of discovery and teaching people that process. And then that becomes lifelong learning that they can apply to the crap that appears on, on the internet. So I, I, anyway. I guess I would just add one brief piece there, which is that I think we need to reestablish a new, the, the norm or, or create a new one that allows for serious conversation about anything and with enough charity among people who fundamentally disagree yeah. that you're not demonizing the, the people you're talking to about these, these hard issues. I mean, what's happening on the left with you know, all of these taboos around conversation and the, the deplatforming of everybody yeah. who's, who's on the right on college campuses, that's just so dysfunctional. We, we have to cure ourselves of this. And you know, the, right, the right returns the favor as well in demonizing people on the left. We, it's just the, the idea that you, if you don't say precisely the right thing immediately so as to conform to some local taboo, you n- now need to be shunned or have your reputation destroyed. It's just silencing sensible conversation on, on everything we should be talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's... yeah. Solomon Letterer, and I have another, another question about free will, so feel free to keep a really uh, a truncated answer. Um, there we go. <laughs> and, and I, go ahead, uh, go ahead, so, get the question. So uh, can't you say that free will exists in the same way that pain or any property of consciousness exists, so that when you, when you feel, for instance, a pinprick, where, where does that pain occur? You can say there's synapses firing, it's, uh, you know, there's something happening in the limbic system, but ultimately it's just cells and, and atoms, you know, cells and atoms all the way down. So we're, but nevertheless, we know that we're feeling a pain, but we're, where is that? Yeah, no, it, it, it's where totally different. For, for me, it's totally different because if, if we found out that the universe was just a single block, that there was no such thing as an event or a cause, there was just, everything's already happened. The future exists as much as the past. 
Let's say that's the right answer, right? And in uh, some pictures it is. But... Yes. Well, let's, let's say that's just true. So process is an illusion. So the future's already written. You're like a novel where you're on page, you're living on, you think you're living on page 60, but page 120 is already written. My experience, my moment-to-moment -moment experience is totally compatible with that being true. Right? I, f I feel that that's possible. In fact, there's nothing in my experience that disconfirms that. Whereas pain is something that I experience. If you told me, well, pain doesn't exist, I would say, well, no, I can find it right now. It's, it's an enormous difference. It could not be more different. Thank you. That. And I'm in agreement. Yes, sir. By the way, I've been told that we have about five minutes left for questions. Uh, <laughs> we will stretch that five minutes. Go ahead. Wow, really? Hi, my name is Joey. Thank you all for your time. Yes, thanks Sam, for coming. I just wanted you to uh, expand on the illusion of the self. Well, it's just, it's the flip side of this, th this very thing with free will. The, the feeling of having, f that you have free will, that you could have done otherwise, for me is the, just the, the, the obverse of the feeling that you're a subject riding around inside your head. So in addition to thoughts arising in consciousness, and intentions arising, and perceptions arising, and language and imagery, and everything that arrives, the contents of consciousness. In addition to all of that, there's a center that is the subject, that is the I, that is the thinker, that is the seer. That is, there's not just seeing, there's a seer of the, see, of, of the thing seen. That feeling of being, as I've said somewhere, the rider on the horse of consciousness that is what it feels like to feel like you're the author of your thoughts and intentions and choices. And I think you can get rid of that. I mean, I know, you, I know what it's like to get rid of that. You can lose that feeling, if only for moments at a time. And when you lose that feeling, everything else remains. If you still see and hear and smell and taste and even think, there's a more expansive feeling of just consciousness and its contents. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to get a long debate. I, 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 dis, I think I do disagree with that. But, but I'm, you know, Philip K. Dick said, reality is that which continues to exist even when you stop believing in it. Here, here's my way of saying that there really is a self, I think. I shoot you. Well, find it. Find it. No, you mean, okay. might, there's I really shoot, a body. I shoot, you, I shoot, you, I shoot you your shoot body. Yes, I shoot your have body, yeah. and your self stops to exist. You seek to exist. That, That's not so, what I mean by self. Well, so, you, you know, the, this is the confusing thing because I'm not so I think saying, you and I are largely people agreement. don't exist. So they, they, there are people. There, there, there is a center of your conscious being. It happens to whether it exists where, in where some. Is, where is well, it? it's. <laughs> it's in. I, I tend to I'll give you a hint. Oh, it's, in, it's in your body. It's not out of your body. Well, no, but you, you so can. So somewhere so, in your body. No, actually, you, you can actually have this experience. Out of body experiences. Illusory, don't give me can, that. No, no, but you can. Oh, no, no. <laughs> You can precipitate it in the lab. What? You can precipitate it in the lab, and we know how to give people an out-of-body experience. Yeah, the solution. Uh, it's, not, it's not that you're really out of your body, but you're, what you're calling your body, I mean, it's just a, as a matter of sheer neurology, this is in your brain right now. You're yeah. Not, like, so it's, it's all in your, the world is in your so brain. So I'm willing to argue that yourself your is in your brain, but it's, well, but it's well, not an illusion, I don't think. I, I put some, I can't, I have not had the experience that Sam has had. So it makes no sense to me, this idea, because for me, Consciousness and the self are, are essentially equivalent, that the, the mind is something the brain does. Uh, curious quick note, if I took out your brain and put it in Lawrence's body, and I took his brain and put it in your body, would you now be Lawrence? Would this no, body I, no, now be no, 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 I, th I think you would go with the brain. I mean, this, yeah, you know, yeah I, I, brain would argue, I, I would argue. And so that somewhere in your brain is what, you, what, what I think effectively, yeah. and I tend yeah. to work in terms of operational definitions as a physicist, effectively yourself is your brain. Well, I, I can explain this. I can make sense of it logically. Again, I mean, so we're, but you're arguing on the basis, the punchline of your argument is that I haven't had the experience I'm telling you I've had. Right? You're saying, no, I'm sure you've had lots of illusionary experiences. Well, no, no but, I, I'm, no, but I can have it right now. <laughs> what? I mean, so like, so, so the, the experience is, the reason why this experience is more credible than the, the experience of feeling like a self is because, there's a few things to say here. One is, in the average case, there's a tremendous amount of training required to just even be able to pay attention to experience enough to notice this thing that I'm claiming is true of consciousness. Right? So you have to, like, if I, I would put you in a room for 10 days mm -hmm. and tell you, give you an exercise for, you know, just pay attention to your breath for the first three days, and every time your mind wanders, just come back to the breath. This is meditation. or I, I know, I did that for two minutes to me. It drives me nuts. Okay, but, yeah. But... but, but, but. But if you became interested in what was driving you nuts, 
you would notice that it's just this automaticity of thinking, right? You're, you're talking to yourself without noticing that you're talking to yourself. And that talking to yourself has consequences. You're yeah, filtering everything that. through this, this conversation. So there's, 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 there's what it's called, the, there's something that people, something training that, they, what's the word that people, oh, could be, in the moment, med moments. Meditation or mindfulness? Mindfulness, yeah, yeah mindfulness. Right. And, okay. and, um, so this is and, a, but this is a genuine skill that you actually don't know anything about, right? <laughs> No, I, I think I, I think I probably do experience your mindfulness sometimes when I'm working on a mathematical problem, but, but that's a great but, analogy. So, so like I I know much less mathematics than you do, right? So you would be perfectly capable of finding a page of equations where I would look at it, and and my my honest experience would be, well, this is gibberish, right? Like I I can't make heads or tails of this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what if I were to say to you, not only does this seem like gibberish to me. I think it actually seems like gibberish to you, and you're just confused oh, no, about it. No, 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 I'm not discounting. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm saying you have a different experience of it. And I've been in, you know, if you, I've been in isolation tanks where you begin to hallucinate, too. And, um, and that's a real experience, as, as Oliver Sacks said. Hallucinations are real to those people that have them. They're just as real as reality. And, and so uh, I guess but, but the, what worries transitory. me about what you say in this yeah. regard is that I hear exactly the same thing when say, people tell me, God is real because I've experienced God. Yeah, I've experienced yeah, no. God in, in my inner sense. And it's, I'm skept I guess I'm just skeptical of that Granted. as well as but I'm skeptical. I think at this point, the You should run the experiment yeah. on yourself because yeah. the first thing you would discover is that it's the thing that you're being asked to do to pay attention. It should make sense to you that in order to find the data, you should be able to direct your attention where the data are. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can't do that, like if I say, you know, we, we're, we're going to run an experiment here and we, we need to look at what's in this glass and you can't even find the glass, that's a problem. You have to find the data. And if you became interested in why that was so difficult, that already would be a revelation. I mean, most people are walking around unaware that there's any alternative to being lost in thought every moment of the day. And they're not, they're not even aware they're lost in thought. It's just, it's, it's just, and the moment they become aware, they think, well, this is just me. I, I, I looked inside for a minute and a half, found nothing of interest, and th there must be no there there. <laughs> it is a domain of expertise, and I'm not, I don't consider no, no, myself I, I'm willing to accept you know, that, at the height of that domain. I know for sure that you have expertise in, in these areas and these experiences right. that I might have. And, that's, and, and, and in many senses, I admire a, a, that, that capability, which I may or may not have. I do, but I don't. I guess I just don't think it defines a different reality. It, it defines a different talent and a different well, self perception. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a different reality. It's just it, it's a it's a very subtle difference in perception of this reality, which which makes a very big difference in the kinds of claims you want to make about the, the nature of the mind. It also just happens to be incredibly useful because so much of our suffering is born of our identification with thought, because sure. so much the character of our thought is so often unhappy. You know, we're yeah, worried we're, about the future, we're re regretting the past, we're living with this conversation with ourselves, and it's, a very, it's a very often an unhappy one. And to be able to break that spell, even for a few moments at a time, can make a world of difference in terms of... Yeah, I mean, well it comes back to uh, something we're talking about uh, uh, otherwise, but it's this notion of uh, offense. We own, in my opinion, we own our, if we're offended, big deal. As as Christopher said, and 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 uh, also another friend of mine, Stephen Fry, it's just being offended doesn't give you any rights to anything. It just means you're offended. But how you choose to respond to that, whether you choose to be hurt or traumatized, or whether you choose to have a discussion, or whether you choose to slough it off, is your is your decision. And so you're the author of of how your internal questioning deals with those external. external Sounds a lot problems. like a variety of free on one level. level. On one level, if you're I'm, free. Yeah. I, I, I threw that I in say, as a I was joke. I going to say you're free to choose how you respond, but I knew I better not say that. No, I, I threw that in as a joke partly because they've just told me that... That was five minutes. Time is up. That was the ten minute uh, five minutes. Which is why I'm so glad that we're doing this a couple more times and we can continue this discussion. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm supposed to tell everybody uh, who's standing in line that, gosh, we love you, and if we weren't so talkative, we would have got to your questions. Uh, but the book sign is going to take place out there. You guys should have the instructions. Uh, Please join me in uh, thanking all of you for coming this evening. Coming. Yeah. And thank you to Sam Harris, Lawrence Strauss, for a great evening. Thank you. All right. Well played, sir. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you so much. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the questions of others. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make this show possible.